stream from Mount Vernon and and welcome everyone to this incredible live stream from Mount Vernon and the Museum of the American Revolution. I am Doug Bradburn, President and CEO of George Washington's Mount Vernon, standing on the beautiful piazza overlooking the extraordinary Potomac River, the Mother River, as George Washington thought it was. And I'm joined today uh, by Dr. R. Scott Stevenson. We'll have to ask him what the R is for because he goes by Scott, as I will uh, talk to him throughout. Uh, Scott, talk about where are you? Who are you and what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, well, I am uh, the president and CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. Uh, but of course, like you, Doug, I'm a historian by training. So uh, we've got that in common. And I'm sitting at the corner of Third and Chestnut Streets in Philadelphia, just two blocks toward the river from Independence Hall, where the museum, which has just been open three years now, uh, from 20, April of 2017, um, uh, is open to the public, and I'm actually sitting in front of the other home of George Washington, uh, what we like to refer to as Washington's War Tent, and uh, it's on display in the museum. Oh, it's a fantastic object there, and, and one thing about your museum, I think if people haven't had a chance to see it, they have to go, particularly lovers of Mount Vernon and all things 18th century. Uh, I don't think there's another museum that it's really makes uh, the object such a star of the show, and you guys have got some great stuff in there. Why don't you talk a little bit, we'll, we'll get to the tent, talk a little bit about some of the other, you know, when you come into the Museum of the American Revolution, what do you experience? What is the point of the museum? Sure. So we're, um, you know, our mission is to uncover and share stories about the diverse people and the complex events that sparked uh, our nation's ongoing experiment in liberty, equality, and self-government. So we uh, while, while our story is sort of deeply rooted in the revolutionary era, and we've got about 16,000 square feet of core exhibition space, it's very, as you know, Doug, it's you know, very immersive. Uh, it combines uh, objects, immersive spaces, a lot of uh, personal stories. It's a very kind of storytelling approach to the, to the founding era, but with a very important mission also to uh, inspire in our visitors an understanding of the American Revolution as an ongoing and unfinished process. So we have a very strong message at the end that, of course, we want you to uh, to be activated as citizens and feel that you're part of this uh, amazing stream of history that reaches back, um, you know, nearly 250 years and and beyond. Well, it's a great message. I, if I remember, you have a great gallery there with has some mirrors and uh, portraits. <laughs> revolutionists and revolutionaries throughout history and, and you're looking at yourself as one of these and I, I think that's a great way to get people excited about that story. Sure thing, sure thing. So uh, where did this museum come from? It's only three years old. Um, you know, museums tend to need lots of stuff to get going, but some of them are story driven. But you know, you've been involved for how long? Uh, I guess 13 years now. I uh, got a call back in uh, the end of 2006 from what was at the time a little two-person startup organization up in Valley Forge mm -hmm. that, um, you know, our, our, we're a successor organization to a very old historical society, which was actually founded around the time of the First World War mm -hmm. uh, by an Episcopal minister named W. Herbert Burke from yeah. Norristown, Pennsylvania, just west of Philadelphia. And he was... Um, Reportedly, his inspiration to found a museum started from an outing uh, with a group of boys around Valley Forge. Of course, this is long before it was a, a, a national or even a state park. And he took these boys on kind of a tromp through the countryside and they walked up a hill and he was going to deliver a very patriotic oration to them to inspire them. And then according to his own telling, realized he didn't really know very much about what happened at Valley Forge. <laughs> so like many of us do, he turned to his bookshelf and uh, and uh, it, it, it started this desire to put a collection together, to build a museum, uh, to commemorate George Washington and the uh, American Revolution. Yeah, he had a particular interest in George Washington, if I recall correctly. What what was Washington to him, and why was he so important to to his collecting? Yeah, I mean, so Burke was a, a you know a child of the Civil War. I, I believe he was born in 1866, and so you know he's growing up and coming of age uh, as 
you know, right. the unfinished work of yeah. the American Revolution. Oh, the the yeah. He's at the since he's 20 years old in, in 1886 or 1876, uh, 10, to, 10 to 20. So in that whole centennial rebirth and, and study of the founding, he's he's coming to coming to have age there. Absolutely. You know, as a 10 year old, it's although I don't think we've located a piece of paper that says this yet. We know that he visited the centennial exhibition here in Philadelphia, where the tent that's sitting behind me was actually put on display. And oh, so it's likely that he maybe even first set eyes on that canvas and other relics of Washington, you know, as a boy. So this is, of course, the period of the colonial revival. And so he's brought up absolutely steeped in this. And, you know, this is an era of, of an attempt to bring the nation back together uh, as, as we do periodically through American history. We, because we're a nation that's not founded on a common religion or a language or a place of origin, it's, it's those, those founders, those founding ideas, wow. that founding history that, that knits us together. And so that's, that was really behind his desire to, to bring a collection together and, and start a museum. Now that's, that's great. So uh, there's the great disbursement of Washingtoniana beginning right after 1876. And then there's another big auction in, 18, in the 1890s. Uh, clearly he gets stuff given to him as well. So uh, talk about some of the great objects that he collected and, and then we'll talk about the tent as one of them as well. So what else did he get in that early collecting phase for the museum at Valley Forge? Yeah, so he was, um, it's, it's amazing. Uh, fortunately, generations of historical society volunteers kept all of his papers. You know, there were there are stories about the moments when someone would come and say, well, why don't we throw out all that old paper? And fortunately, every time there was someone to keep it. So it's it's wonderful to go back through the correspondence because as a as a museum director, and this will resonate with you, Doug, you read through the letters and the ways that he tried to raise money to solicit donations of objects. I mean, it's like the direct mail that we all receive from Mount Vernon and the Museum of the American Revolution. He'd write letters to people and say, you know, surely you uh, are inspired by the founding of the nation and would give one dollar to help us to acquire this object or that object or to help, uh, you know, form a, a fund uh, to eventually uh, build a, a new museum. But ironically, the tent was probably the first significant object that mm -hmm. launched the Valley Forge Historical Society and that acquisition. And that's an amazing story that actually connects very directly to Mount Vernon. Oh, we'll get, well, let's talk about that. I mean, that, that period, well, well, one question I'll ask as we talk about that. So during that period of time from 1885 to 1937, there was one resident superintendent of Mount Vernon. Uh, it was run by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, of course, who acquired it in, right at, you know, in 1858. <clears throat> and it managed it as a, as a museum for people to visit since, uh, you know, from that time, from 1860, we're in our 160th year. But the resident director, which is essentially my position, um, <laughs> the live on boss, uh, who's responsible, uh, he, he was um, a man by the name of Colonel Harrison Dodge. And he was in that role from 1885 to 1937. So he would have overlapped with the collecting of your boy, uh, Reverend Hunt, Reverend Burke, Reverend Burke, yep, right? Yep, yeah, Reverend Burke, yep, yep. Did they know each other at all? And what was the relationship of Mount Vernon to this early Valley Forge movement? No, it's an excellent question because uh, Burke was very competitive, obviously. So he was writing to Washington yeah. descendants, you know, trying as to make- As we are, Scott, as we are. <laughs> no, 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 we're, we're very gentlemanly in our pursuits oh, of both. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Yeah. No. So there are a few letters in there and, and, um, uh, you know, letters of inquiry back and forth. Uh, so they're definitely aware of each other's uh, efforts at this point. No doubt about it. All right. So how did he get the tent? This is a tent that, from what I know, and you can correct me, a, a tent that uh, George Washington Park Custis, who is the, uh, you know, the, the grandson of Martha Washington, adopted grandson of George Washington, he gets the tent amongst many other items after Martha Washington's passing. Uh, and he, of course, builds Arlington House across the river from Washington, D.C. And that's really the first museum for all things George Washington because he'll he has all the great old peel portraits. He's got all this old, you know, China. He's got all the old silver. He's got all this great stuff. And the tent is something that he would put up out on his 
lawn, you know, overlooking DC, and, you know, occasionally, and he'd have his own like sheep over there, and, and folks from DC would come over. This is like what the 1830s and 40s. People uh, even earlier, yeah, tent and give Fourth of July orations and that kind of stuff. And then, and I don't know what happens to the tent until somehow your guy steals it and it doesn't come to mind. <laughs> so, so it was, very, it was complete, what, completely consensual. So what do I? What did I get wrong there? And then what happens after George Washington Park? Sure. Custom? So you did a pretty good job, but <laughs> so I'll I'll dial it back a little bit. Go back to the Revolutionary War. Uh, okay. Of course, I'm yeah. sitting two blocks from where Washington receives his commission as commander in chief of the Continental Army yeah. in June of 1775. And he, of course, had come to Philadelphia uh, not knowing that a war had broken out in Massachusetts. So he did come, you know, famously wearing a uniform that he had he had um, designed and had made for himself over that previous winter. This is between the yeah. First Continental Congress and, and re coming back to Philadelphia in May of 1775 for what would be a follow-up to that First Continental Congress. So he came to Philadelphia wanting to signal his willingness to take yeah. up arms. And that was the uniform of the Fairfax County volunteer groups that he was sort of the commander of at this point. That's correct. The blue and buff uniform that, of course, the ancient Whig colors. And, and you know, he had told John Adams when they first met the previous fall that that uh, he was willing to, you know, take to the field to raise a regiment himself. Uh, right. So he's signaling that by coming to Congress uh, wearing that uniform. However, he did not pack uh, his camping gear because, of course, did not know a war had started. Right. And, of course, he's given this commission by Congress and immediately heads to Boston in send it back to Mount Vernon. And um, as often happens, you know, you think about there, he writes two letters, both of which we own, one to Martha Washington, well, two to Martha Washington, one to um, – uh, Burl, Bassett Burl, Burl Bassett, yeah. who's his yeah. brother-in-law. Anyway, go on. I retain no, that, that, that in affection. That letter to to Martha Washington, you know, sort of explaining why he won't why he won't be coming home quite as soon as uh, he expected. He says, "I'll be back by Christmas." So right. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> of course, at the beginning of every war, we all think this is going to be over very quickly, right? There's, of course, famously at the beginning of the American Civil War, all the Washingtonians who ride out to watch the Battle of Manassas and uh, think, "Well, oh, this is going to be over." <laughs> I don't want to miss it. Exactly. Yeah. So by October of 1775, it's clear that the British are here to stay for a while. And so he sends his aide, uh, Joseph Reed, back to Philadelphia here because this is the largest city. This is the place you shop uh, if you're if you're looking for goods yeah. in, uh, at the, in this revolution era to, to put together uh, the camp equipment that he would need to take the field the following year. And that's, it's literally a block and a half from where I'm sitting at the corner of 4th and Chestnut Streets at the sign of the easy chair kept by Plunkett Fleeson, who was a, an upholsterer who quickly turned to war industry yeah. uh, in yeah. 1775. That his first suite of tents, his mobile field headquarters, were first constructed and sent to him for the summer campaign of 1776. So these were tents that were constructed in Philadelphia. They're not London made and then re refigured for American use. That's correct. They're they're following patterns that were you know very commonly used in European tradition. They're actually tents very similar to this that go back at least to the Roman era. So it's a very tried and true um, style of tents. Yeah, you do a gladiator theme, you know, at some point as well, right, where Julius Caesar can walk out of the tent and have somebody executed over here. Uh, Washington was familiar with the great emporium for military goods that, that Philadelphia represented. He had already been purchasing items for the Fairfax County, uh, you know, uh, units that they've been putting together, including, I think, a musket that you have a sample of in your collection as well, but uh, muskets. But anyway, go on. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, so that first set of tents gets shipped up in New York. Of course, we, we've all read David McCullough probably or uh, uh, David Hackett Fisher on 1776 and that long campaign. Washington stays in the field with the army, you know, far into early 1777. They do it again in 1777, the Philadelphia campaign, marching into Valley Forge, you know, the, basically a few days before Christmas. 
And then Washington reportedly remaining under canvas until the men were under huts. And so um, fall is the cruelest time of all for homes made of fabric. And so by the Valley Forge encampment, that first suite of tents, and I, I should mention, and behind me is, is, is the sleeping and office tent. And so his practice was to have a separate dining tent that was meetings for larger gatherings and then a private space, this, this sleeping and office tent. Um, we have the original receipts that have survived from 1776. During the Valley Forge winter, they're preparing to march out again, a second set of these tents are constructed. And those are the tents that have survived. And okay. at the end of the Revolutionary War in 1783, when Washington makes his famous Christmas return to uh, to Mount Vernon, he, of course, he has his military papers, his uniforms, his sword, I and mean, all of that equipment that uh, is carefully stowed away. And actually, I love when I visit Mount Vernon and I'm walking up the green toward the mansion, the storehouse that's immediately on your right as you're approaching and walking toward the river, we know from a letter in the 1790s that that's where the tent was stored uh, after the war. And he, uh, there's uh, orders to one of his uh, uh, overseers of the plantation to take it out and very carefully clean it and air it. And uh, he even describes it being in a portmanteau. That's the, the storage container that actually has survived and is here at the museum as well. Did he imagine that that tent would see service again when he was brought back for the quasi war? A command at the end of the, at the end of the war is that the context of that letter, or was this just the general maintenance that he wanted? Yeah, to this is earlier. If I remember correctly, it might be 1791. It's you know oh, it's during it's yeah. during the presidency, oh, yeah. and of course when he's expecting to take the field again during the quasi war, one of the interesting things we have in the collection here we have um, several of Washington's silver camp cups from the Revolutionary War. He had several sets of these cups made. Um, there's a kind of a very plain unmarked set uh, that was made here in Philadelphia in 1777. But curiously, and something that confused generations of curators, this was a set of 12 camp cups that are all marked by Edmund Milne, who was the Philadelphia silversmith. The original bill survives, but there were four that descended through the family that were marked by an Alexandria silversmith who was not working until the 1790s. Mm. What we think was going on is when he was expecting to take the field in 1798, he actually went back and expanded some of that camp equipment. And there's evidence in the papers of things like getting another tent made, a, the uniform that has survived that's at the uh, at the Smithsonian is believed to date from, from that period. Yeah, um, yeah. So he's... He's a guy who, you know, the er some of the earliest writing we have of Washington is as a 16-year-old surveyor writing about sleeping in a tent. And I've reflected a lot about, you know, his entire adult life, he spends an awful lot of time camping outdoors. He knows how to do it by the, by the end there, that's for sure. And it seems like uh, the suite he had in the Revolution was pretty nice. So you say behind you, you have uh, the dining and office tent and that there's another tent or that he would have had another tent that was his dining, or I'm sorry, you yeah. have sleeping an office tent and he would have yeah. had another tent where that was a dining tent. So where is the dining tent? Did we, is that down in Yorktown? Is that destroyed? Right. No, no, it's super, super confusing here, <laughs> but I'll, I'll pull all the threads apart. So what happens is this, all of these tents and this camp equipment returns to Mount Vernon in 1783, right where you're standing. <laughs> in, in 1802, after Martha Washington's death, there's a there's a private sale of a lot of the contents of Mount Vernon. And this is when Martha's grandson, adopted son of, of George Washington, George Washington Park Custis, purchases and acquires a lot of these items that eventually will be on display in Arlington House. And that includes Washington's tents. Mm. And so he builds Arlington House. Um, as you mentioned earlier, it's really earlier than you'd mentioned by around the War of 1812, the first, say, decade and a half of the 19th century. He has this annual tradition of setting up the tents on his estate at Arlington, giving these orations. He referred to the tent behind me as the Praetorium of Liberty, which I which I love. Um, and so, so use that now in all your advertisements. Come absolutely. See. Come see the Praetorium of Liberty. <laughs>
um, and so, yeah, when you think about all the uses of these tents after the Revolutionary War, it is amazing there's anything left to see. Because not only is he setting these up at Arlington, but then when the Marquis de Lafayette returns to America in 1824, 1825, anticipating the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, George Washington Park Custis sends the tent up to um, Fort McHenry in Baltimore, and they display two relics, American history relics. One of them is this huge flag that we sing about before all of our sporting events, the right. Star Spangled Banner. Oh, glory. And yeah, go on. Yeah, so, um, so uh, just a few years later, 1831, George Washington Park Custis's daughter marries a dashing young uh, artillery officer in the United States Army, graduated first in his class from uh, West Point, Robert Edward Lee. And um, that is the connection that is you know, often remembered to Arlington House, of course, fast forwarding to uh, 1861. So the tent is, you know, and, and other items, as you mentioned earlier, Martha Washington's China, all these relics of Mount Vernon are at Arlington House when the American Civil War breaks out. And of course, Robert Lee uh, becomes uh, Confederate general and the home of Washington is, or sorry, the home of, of, of Custis Lee taken over by federal troops. Of course, it's a strategic high ground yeah. overlooking Washington, DC, but that's where all these uh, objects are locked away uh, and put under the care of an enslaved woman named Selena Gray, whose story we tell uh, here at the museum and was left with the key to the mansion. She was the personal servant to, to Mary Custis Lee and, um, you know, was left in charge of all these items. Yeah, and she really protects a lot of this uh, memorabilia, these these uh, important artifacts that we use today here at Mount Vernon. There's some at W&L College. You have some. I mean, they're, they're kind of all over the place. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the remarkable things about this object, and it was uh, in, the, in the decade before we actually built the museum and as I was researching the tent and trying to figure out like how to present the story. Um, so the test audience, of course, was hundreds of church groups and historical societies and old age homes and that, you know, just giving talks about Washington's tent. And yeah. everyone would ask that question, well, how do you know it's Washington's tent? And <laughs> so um, one of the amazing things about the object is we literally know where it's been virtually every day of its life. Oh, and it, it, it influenced the story that we tell here, as, as you've experienced, and I'm sure many of the people watching who've uh, visited the museum know that um, when you come to the museum, you come into the theater that I've seated in, and we start a 12-minute film that kind of takes you on this journey, not just through the Revolutionary War, but through the 19th century and the history uh, of the tent in subsequent years before it's revealed very dramatically that you see uh, behind me. Yeah, for those of you who haven't experienced the interpretation of the tent in situ at the museum, I encourage you once they're able to open again uh, to get there and, and do it because it's really powerful and moving. In some ways, you've you've elevated the tent to the status of the Liberty Bell or the status of the Statue of Liberty. I mean, these, these iconic... Um, pieces of our past that have been with us and can be metaphorical, but also powerful because they're real. And, uh, you know, you've done such a tremendous job with that. Now, I know that um, you didn't just come up with that day one. I mean, it took you some time to develop how you talk about the tent. And I, I, I would like you to talk a little bit about that process. Um, you know, as historians, of course, we are interpreters of the past. The past is unknowable. It has happened. It is gone. And, and so, we have sometimes we're really lucky. We have actual stuff that exists from the past that yeah. uh, people experienced, and 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 these places are powerful in in, ev in evoking that history or the, evoking that past. And the history is help helpful to get people to understand why it's relevant to them today. And, and so, how did you decide what to do with the tent? I mean, I I um, I'll interject momentarily here and let you take it. Uh, I, I originally. I think there was an original effort to think of it as like the first Oval Office, um, but I think you you abandoned that as not big enough. Uh, but talk, talk a little bit about interpreting objects and bringing things to people in a way that's powerful. 
Sure thing. Yeah. I mean, um, one thing that drives me in my, my approach and why I, I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world to have the job that I have is, you know, the way I came to my love of history was through stories. You know, it was a, my grandfather driving the back roads and telling stories, whether they were true or not, I don't know about what happened here and what happened there. And, you know, just the story part of, of history yeah. and really um, feeling a kind of emotional response to being in the presence of objects. So I do feel there's a, there's a power um, that I can look at a million pictures of the porch where you're standing there, but it, it, it washes over me when I stand there and look out over the Potomac. Uh, absolutely. Or, or I, you know, stand in the front of what I came to realize was not just a tent, but was another home of George Washington. And, um, you know, one of the things I, one of the pieces of uh, sort of evidence that I came across uh, during the research was it was actually written by George Washington Park Custis. So he did a book. Um, it was sort of a pulled together by his daughter, but was his writings about Washington. And they were recollections of his growing up. They were stories that people had told him. And one of those stories was from a man named John Nicholas, who had been an officer in Washington's commander in chief's guard. And so for a period during the Revolutionary War had been the, the troops that were detached to protect Washington, they were in charge of setting up and taking down these tents every night when the army was on the move, security, et cetera. And uh, Nicholas wrote about how Washington, when he would go into that tent, no one would disturb him. There were orders, there were guards posted on those doors and no one would go in there. <laughs> and yeah. you'd have to wait until he came to the door. Uh, no matter what was no matter what was going on. And the image that flashed in my mind was that famous black and white photo that we all know of John F. Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, standing at the Resolute desk, you know, with his head bowed. Yeah. And then you think about all the other commanders in chief in the first Oval Office. And so that, that phrase, which was always intended to be a little playful, uh, the first Oval Office, was was thinking about this as the only private space mm -hmm. that George Washington had for, you know, much of those eight years. Eight years. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And understanding, you know, it's actually quite a complex piece of architecture itself. It's there's a divisions with within the tent. So there's a little sitting room. There's a, a sort of an end where his bed would be set up. The other end, which would be um, on this side here. I'm not sure what direction that is for viewers, but yeah. um over my right shoulder, that would be where uh, William Lee, his enslaved valet, lived and mm -hmm. actually had its own separate entrance for coming and going. So sort of thinking about that as this home of Washington yeah. was, you know, really opened things up. But frankly, I was concerned because it is, it is a tent. It's not the Star Spangled Banner. You know, we all sing about the Star Spangled Banner. When yeah. I'm in the presence of a big flag, we all feel kind of that emotional response. And this is actually a true story. And this is what, what made me sort of double down on wanting to, to make this a very powerful experience. Uh, back in, uh, I guess it was June of 2012, I had an opportunity to sit with David McCullough uh, up at his, uh, his apartment up in Copley Square and kind of talk about early ideas for the museum and everything. And, and I was very excited, you know, telling him about the idea of being able to see Washington's pen. And he looked at me and he said, Scott, I I wouldn't make too much of that tent. It's 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 just a tent. <laughs> I, uh, that's a little intimidating from a guy coming coming from a David David McCullough. He said, "Let me show you, old man. I'm going to show you what this well, tent." <laughs> he set the bar pretty high. I can't so, believe you did that, Scott. Wow. You know, so, so really, storytelling was going to be so important of of preparing you to be in the presence of this uh, object and. It was one of the greatest moments of my career on, on April 19th, 2017. In the room I'm sitting in, I sat here uh, with David and, and he saw the tent uh, for the first time and, and gave it a double thumbs up. And he's been a great, great advocate for us, you know, of course, all through the process and, and since then. Yeah, well, the tent is incredibly powerful. I'm going to get to some questions here in a moment because uh, sure. uh, we got to get the chance for the audience to get at you. <laughs> a little bit, um, maybe test your assumptions there. But 
I mean, congratulations in, in what you've done. The lights have just gone off behind you, so that means it's time for questions. <laughs> so, Matt, what do you what do you got for us here? Yeah, we, David uh, would like to know: Did Washington create a list of names of soldiers in the Continental Army? All right, Scott, did you hear that? Did David want yeah. to? Say, did Washington create lists of soldiers? So what do we know about what do we know about his bookkeeping? <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those wonderful moments. Uh, I. I always love when people who are so stoic and in control of themselves, like Washington, sort of lose their temper a little bit. And so actually, one of the first things Washington does when he takes command and he arrives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, is like asks for returns yeah. of, of the soldiers. And of course, I think a week or two goes by and, and they still can't actually tell him how many men are there, uh, et cetera. Um, and so this was one of his one of his great struggles through eight years, um, although they made a lot of progress. Um, so, uh, you know. Yeah, Washington knew how to run an army, uh, at least in theory, and, and in practice, obviously, all the work he'd done in the French and Indian War uh, yeah. with his regiment, but nobody else did. <laughs> and that was <laughs> the first problem, right? I mean, it, right. like the basics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, certainly, you know, muster rolls, lists of soldiers. I mean, probably the, the big challenge we face as historians is the atrophy that has come through time. There was a large fire uh, early in the 19th century of the War Department that destroyed a lot of records from the Revolutionary War. Um, and so it's, uh, this has been one of the great things about digitization uh, through the National Archives, Library of Congress, through, you know, other repositories through um, for-profit companies like Fold3, uh, Ancestry, of making it possible to actually do, do the research and to kind of piece together as much as we can uh, the names of um, soldiers who, who served the American cause. But um, Yeah, the, the great pension records, of course, are crucial there as well. But wa And Washington's own papers are one of the best sources that we can, we can get at. All right, how about another yeah. question here, Matt? What do we got? Yeah, a question from Elizabeth uh, for Scott. Uh, what has been your favorite guest response to viewing the Washington tent? Can you read that, Scott, or, or could you hear the question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, it's it's definitely the tears that I see on people's faces. It uh, it it's incredible. You know, what I mentioned earlier um, when Lafayette was reunited with officers of the Society of the Cincinnati. These were Revolutionary War officers who had formed this hereditary society still in existence today with their wonderful museum at Anderson House there in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, so in October of 1824, uh, they were all, you know, they all met Lafayette as he disembarked from a steamship at Fort McHenry and they stood under the tent. Charles Carroll from Maryland, the last surviving signer of the Declaration, was there. And Lafayette, according to all those present, you know, shed tears and said, I remember. And that night, John Quincy Adams, who, of course, is a nine year old boy, had climbed up on the roof of his house with his mother, Abigail, to listen to the to the, you know, guns firing at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, he gave a toast of tears of gratitude and joy under the tent of Washington. And so to me, the. the it is an incredible experience to be here in this theater. And I have literally been here with a, an entire room full of seventh grade boys from Boston and World War II veterans and seeing them have that same response of, of shedding tears uh, in the presence of this, uh, of this uh, war tent of Washington. I think that, that's been, you know, reminds me why we do what we do. I, I had a similar experience when I was there the first time and saw it. And as, you know, a, a well-practiced historian hand, I was surprised at the emotions you were able to manipulate out of my deep, deep soul. But it was a powerful, powerful moment. And I'll, I'll name some names as well, because I was, uh, we did a conference uh, in, um, was it in Turin? I don't know. I was with uh, Professor Jane Kamensky, who sure. I know is somebody you know well yeah. and my be on your board, but Jane, our board, yeah, of course, the great historian, but not one that I would call, you know, uh, going to be very patriotic, you know, in a sense, <laughs> you know, he's going to get up and shout about uh, patriotism. And she admitted that she cried at, at the uh, betrayal of your tent. And so it's really remarkable that people all across, 
you know, experience levels and the political spectrum and the education mm -hmm. levels uh, are, are moved by your interpretation there. Mm -hmm. Another question. Yeah, Alice would like to know, uh, why do some sources dispute the aut authenticity of the Washington blue flag with white stars? Ah, now let's talk about one of the other iconic sure. items come back to Mount Vernon. Uh, it is your uh, your beautiful standard of Washington, the commander in chief mm -hmm. standard uh, with the great six-sided stars. I'm uh, wearing it on my lapel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's the symbol of your museum. Why yeah. do people doubt its authenticity, Scott? Sure. Yeah. So a brief history on on the on the um, on the flag, the standard. So um, I I should have mentioned the way the tent came into the possession of Reverend Burke, of course, because in in 1906, ironically, directly across the street from where I'm sitting, a Philadelphia newspaper published an article that was uh, an interview with Miss Miss Mary Custis Lee, so the daughter of Robert E. Lee in which she announced that she wanted to sell the two surviving tents of George Washington, the, the sleeping and office tent and, and his, uh, his dining marquee, in order to fund the Confederate widow's home in Richmond, Virginia, um, which was basically right where the Museum of Fine Arts in, in Richmond is located today. And so Reverend Burke, it took a couple of years, but he raised a down payment of a $5,000 a uh, purchase price for the sleeping in office tent, took the train down in August of 1909, picked up the tent, brought it on the train to Valley Forge, placed it on display. Within a couple of weeks, when he was taking a, a group of uh, ladies around, uh, his, his collection there, at, at, which was on display at the Washington Memorial Chapel, uh, one of the women said, well, I know where the flag that goes with that tent is, and introduced Reverend Burke to a descendant of Washington's uh, nephew. So yeah, Lewis's, I think, right? Lewis's the Lewis family, exactly. And George Lewis had been an officer uh, during during the Revolutionary War for uh, in Washington's Commander-in-Chief's Guard. And this flag, which is a 13-star flag, a, a light blue field, uh, had come down in the family with the history of having been the standard that marked Washington's presence in the field and in camp. Um, and so since 1909, that's been in the collection here, um, you know, first at Valley Forge and then at the museum. Now, flag scholars had sort of debated and, and questioned, well, was it the canton, meaning the upper quadrant of a larger flag that had been, that had been you know, cut out of it and passed down? Um, we actually had some conservation work done almost 10 years ago that was funded by the Pennsylvania Society of the Sons of the Revolution and its color guard here in Philadelphia. And we did very detailed forensic analysis of that flag. And we were able to, to show that it, it wasn't cut out of or, or part of a larger stand, you know, flag. It was, it was made as a, a self-contained um, piece. Yeah. Now, we, we don't have written documentation during the Revolutionary War telling us when it was made, uh, you know, describing it in Washington suite. So we're always careful to say it's traditionally said to have been used, um, but it has an excellent provenance. Um, certainly there are a number of painters, Charles Wilson Peel, you know, others in the period who, you know, during Washington's life often will place a flag with a similar uh, arrangement of stars in association with Washington uh, and so that's uh, the best we know at the moment. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great object as as well. Now you mentioned uh, that Miss Miss Custis. So this is um, uh, Robert E. Lee's daughter. Robert E. Lee married Mary Custis. Is that right, Mary? Yeah, and Mary they, Anna Randolph Custis. And they, had, and they had a daughter named what was her name? That, who had the ten? Mar uh, Mary. Custis, and she never married. So okay, right. So you mentioned that she did specifically didn't think these tents belonged at Mount Vernon. So why? Well, you didn't mention it here, but you mentioned it to me off off camera. Sure. Tell me that story. I've I've never heard that. Or if I did, I've forgotten it. So what is yeah, that? Yeah, and and so the expert on this actually is our our public programs manager at the museum, uh, Hannah Betcher, who wrote her master's thesis at the Winter Program uh, in Delaware, actually on Mary Custis Lee and the Washington relics, because of course, as the last surviving uh, child of Robert E. Lee, and she was the one who decided sort of how to place and disperse these objects. And so yeah. 
yeah. uh, you know, there's a wonderful work on her thinking about where these things would go. Um, I believe she's the one, for instance, who returned the, um, the uh, is it the chandelier, you call it, in the central passage there to Mount Vernon? Um, yeah, it's the, the, the lamp in there. Yeah, sure. the lamp, right, exactly. Um, uh, and so um, uh, I'd be I'd be stealing her thunder to, to go back through the whole story there. But yeah. she was very, very, you know, she and also um, an important an important part of the story with the dance is her feeling uh, an obligation to the widows of the men who had served under her father right. during the Civil War. Who, of course, in the you know by 1900 or so were um, you know were many of them quite elderly and indigent as a result of their uh, service. And, uh, she was trying to raise ten thousand dollars, quite a sum in the period, to ensure that they'd be cared for uh, in their uh, in their lifetimes. Yeah, well, so that's a good story. I mean, I think that you know it, there are so many different Washington items all over, and of course. Mount Vernon would love to have something like that. But, you know, as you guys rightly would show, the tent wasn't at Mount Vernon. And most of its life, it wasn't at Mount Vernon. You know, it may sure. have made an appearance on its way to Yorktown, but it's likely Washington probably slept in his own bed uh, <laughs> at that point. But, uh, right. uh, it, you know, but but it, so it's interesting that, you you know, we it's good to actually have some of this authenticity spread around. So sure. that people can experience the story of the revolution in that powerful way. Uh, all right, let's have another uh, question here. Yeah, sorry about the noise in the background, but I don't know if anybody can hear it. Go ahead. So, Doug uh, and, and Scott, a question from Heather. Uh, she would like to know what each of you think Washington's stance on the Civil War would have been. Oh, that's a great one. Why don't you go first, Scott? And or unless you want me to leap into it, uh, what would Washington have thought about the Civil War? I, I I would say probably two thumbs down, Doug. What would what do you think? Yeah, I mean that that's a no brainer to me. I mean he, he he the farewell address spells it out pretty clearly. What he what he wanted his message to be is that Americans belong together in one union, and that union uh, was the thing that could get you know get them around all their differences that were necessarily a part of our freedom here. But uh, but it was you know the union was key. That's what he devoted his life to, and to see it severed particularly with Virginia uh, being carved off would have been very painful to him. Interestingly, um, you know, I think it's in Jefferson's uh, re uh, notes uh, in his annas where he, he records uh, Washington uh, saying uh, it, it, if, uh, if there was a separation of the states that he would go to the northward. So his own attitudes really towards the end of his life were certainly not provincial, not based on state, but really about the national uh, story of the United States. Yes. So we have a question from uh, Adonis who would like to know, uh, would, would the tent, Washington have used the tent during winter and how would it have been heated? Yeah, tell me about how cold the tent gets in the winter. How do you heat a tent without burning it down? Yeah, no, this is great. So the, you know, the, um, the original has no provision for a stove or any, any heat. And this was generally you know, used in, in fair weather. Um, although, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've got evidence of Washington, particularly in 1776 and 77, um, remaining under canvas quite, quite late in the season. Um, this is one of the great things about what sometimes called experimental archaeology. Uh, and if you've been to Mount Vernon for the annual Revolutionary War weekend, this is unfortunately the first year we've 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 had to skip uh, bringing the replica that we constructed, uh, not just of the sleeping and office tent, but also the dining tent and Washington's baggage tent. We uh, partnered with Colonial Williamsburg and their Department of Historic Trades uh, back in 2013 and then again in 2015 to commission hand-sewn replicas uh, of these tents. So what that allowed us to do to us to really understand how all the pieces and parts, which as we kind of skipped through earlier, you know, have become scattered in the right. intervening uh, centuries and some parts have not survived. So now having a functional replica, you know, we in 2015, for instance, brought first set up that whole suite of replica tents at Mount Vernon uh, during uh, the fall conference. And it was a chilly, you know, probably 40, low 40s and rain that weekend. And what's remarkable about the sleeping in office tent is because it has this 
inner chamber. Um, it provides a lot of insulating, you know, uh, dead air space. And with the heat of a couple of bodies, it was actually quite, quite, uh, you know, comfortable yeah. um, in that. But you certainly wouldn't want to spend all winter under canvas. <laughs> I, well, I remember that night uh, at the comp at the conference where you set up the multiple tents. Yeah. Beautiful light out there because we had a candlelight, a simulated candlelight yeah. uh, in the evenings. And it was, uh, it was incredibly evocative uh, yeah. th that evening. Really wonderfully done. And we did miss you this year as we missed everybody at our uh, our big Revolutionary War weekend, which is usually the first weekend in May. We'll definitely try to do it again next year and, uh, yeah. and we'll get to bring our two great institutions together. Matt, what do you got? Scott Scarlett would like to know uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the preservation process and how you've kept the tent in such great condition. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, it is uh, as early as 1824, there were writers who were commenting about the tent being in fragile condition and particularly the inner sleeping chamber, uh, which is actually now on display down at Yorktown Battlefield, the National Park Service site. And in Virginia, um, but you know, sort of being very uh, filled with holes and threadbare, et cetera. And then um, another great moment is uh, in 1833, George Washington Park Custis had loaned it to the Baltimore Museum. And uh, he, there's a wonderful letter that survives. He was, of course, a, new, a newlywed still and writes to his wife who's uh, at Arlington saying that he had seen the tent on display that it was actually set up on a stage with lanterns around it and that looked it looked beautiful and lifelike and that he had um, uh, made sure that the watchman knew not to put the lanterns too close to it because it was very flammable so when you think that there's anything to look at now um, and, and maybe we'll get the lights back up on it uh, so you can <laughs> a little bit better Alex <laughs> um, uh, it's amazing that there's anything left to survive. So we had to, uh, the, the tent was um, uh, basically brought from Arlington into Washington, D.C. During the Civil War, it, it was, you know, stayed at the Smithsonian until 1901 when it was, the custody was returned to the Lee family. Um, but it stayed there on deposit until uh, 1909. It went to Valley Forge. By the 1970s, it, it was still sort of had all the accumulated dust uh, of, of all those centuries of storage. It was loaned to the National Park Service and placed on display at Valley Forge Park. And many of our um, uh, uh, probably viewers of a certain age uh, may have remembered seeing it on display in the 1970s and 80s out at Valley Forge Park. It was wet cleaned at the time. They built basically a big swimming pool and kind of washed it and, and took some of, that, uh, some of that accumulated dirt out of it. But we had to do extensive conservation in advance of placing it on display in the museum. So Virginia Whalen, who's a uh, textile conservator here in Philadelphia working uh, with an assistant, uh, Joanna Hurd, spent the better part of two years actually with us almost every day, literally going over the entire thing, every tiny little hole. Stitch by they, stitch. They had to re reinforce, you know, every loose thread got stitched down so there'd be no more loss of fiber. So it was very, very painstaking. That's extraordinary. It's uh, it's now, it's quite the relic in that sense. You know, but yeah. it, it is, we're very lucky. Obviously, we've lost a lot of our, uh, artifacts from the 18th century, but George Washington was such a powerful figure that he was collectible right from the start. And and the fact that it, you know the tent, like Mount Vernon, was treated as a special special place, uh, you know, for 200 years. I mean, that's really remarkable in a country that's only 200 years old. Right. So uh, it is, we're we're fortunate in that regard. Uh, how about another question? So have you ever used the tagline, "The tent where it happens"? Uh, you bet. <laughs> yeah, okay. So Scott, a question from Cynthia. Uh, she'd like to know how is the, the tent packaged and how uh, is it transported? How heavy was it? You love this. this is, now you're getting into Scott's total nerd. <laughs> he loves questions like this because I've seen him talk about how this tent is moved and carried around. So why don't you, let's yeah. what is the story? Well, to use a modern analogy, when the replica of the tent that's sitting behind me uh, is – all broken down into its component parts. I can drive to Mount Vernon in my Subaru Outback uh, and have space left over for an overnight bag. Uh, it's it's designed 
to be very portable. So the poles, uh, there are two upright poles that are called standards uh, and they are sectioned in two pieces each. And then there's a ridge pole that also is uh, broken down. And so it's, a, it's sort of America's first camping equipment. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. Then the wall, there are two exterior walls that um, are actually very similar. If you've ever had a party rental tent, if you know there's, there's kind of the roof with the valence, that's the little scalloped edge that hangs down and underneath that hooks and eyes so you can hang those walls. Um, and so in many ways, the design of these hasn't changed a lot. So those pieces all come apart. That inner chamber um, basically has a, a sleeve along the top. So it hangs from that, that roof line and it, it all is pulled out into shape with ropes and uh, tent stakes. So it's, it's, there's no internal rigidity to it at all. It's all, it's all, about, all about tension. And frankly, that was one of the challenges of how do we make it look like it's set up? As you see behind me, there's no tension on those pieces. Essentially, wow. what we designed is kind of an umbrella structure that's underneath the roof there. Okay. So that the roof is just resting on that. Resting on there um, rather than, than yeah. being cool. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. all of those pieces kind of roll up. There were bags that, that they all fit into. There, uh, Washington also had two uh, leather portmanteau. They essentially look like big duffel bags that um, he acquired at the same time. Those in the period we think were probably used to store his bedding. So his mattress, sheets, you know, blankets and that. But by the 1790s, we know, because Washington specifically mentioned uh, when, you know, they were, they were cleaning and, and repairing and, and inspecting the tents that they were being stored in those leather portmanteau. They were seen by people at Arlington House in the 19th century. Uh, they were drawn, you know, by uh, traveling artists at the time and actually were still with the tents uh, when when Burke acquired the tent in 1909. So that original leather case is still is still with it here on display in the museum. So yeah. great question. That's fascinating. How many people does it take to put it up, Scott, when you do it, the new tent? And then how many? Sure. Yeah, we can. Uh, we're getting faster and better. Uh, we can do it with about uh, probably four or five, um, you know, people that have got reasonable reasonable strength. And of course, Washington had his commander in chief's guard who did this, you know, every day. And so it takes us now, you know, about an hour to set it up. Um, I think it could have been done, you know, faster in the period with with experienced uh, soldiers. And of course, this was part of his baggage. So at one point, you know, Washington had a baggage train of as many as 18 wagons with not just his own sort of gear, but also that of the soldiers that accompanied him, his aides, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it was quite quite a gypsy band on the road. Well, it also speaks to the, te the tactical challenges of moving an army in the 18th century. I mean, you're, you're moving all this other stuff with the soldiers and their ammunition, you know. Uh, you know, you could, you, we know that uh, Burgoyne's army uh, in upstate New York, when it was captured, I mean, Burgoyne had something like 36 wagons in his own suite with cases and cases of champagne and, you know, all the food and the silver, full suites of silver to set up his table with. I mean, these guys, these generals in the 18th century, they travel in style. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to note that um, compared to like a Burgoyne, for instance, Washington's tent is not significantly larger than that of other, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, field grade officers. Um, you know, it's, um, it's uh, actually one of the interesting things we found during our analysis and conservation is that the, the two side entrances, and you can kind of see behind me the little poles sticking up that are uh, one of these side entrances, and there's one on the other side, that actually the tent as it was originally constructed that entrance was about six inches lower and that very early on they inserted extra fabric to lift that up a little bit. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, discussion recently, a recent book that I know you know well that's uh, talked about uh, historians' obsession with Washington's uh, physical presence, et cetera, et cetera. You're and, one of the five men, I think, aren't you, Scott? Uh, I'm a five man when it comes to Washington. Uh, you're, a very, you're, I'm tall, imposing but, figure. you're a tall, imposing figure yourself, so you, <laughs> you use your threatening physicality to command your staff there. I know, whereas I use 
humor and uh, patience. You are <laughs> no very doubt about it. <laughs> but we know, yeah. So we know that this tent actually was 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 adapted to Washington, but it was also creating. The, the role of a Republican general during this period. Of course, yeah. this is a story well told at Mount Vernon, and it's important to us that Washington, everyone was wondering from day one, will this guy go home at the end of this war, or is there just going to be a new King George? And um, so he's very conscious about his uniform, about the trappings, about not, you know, what, what, what does it mean to be a Republican general? And that's absolutely expressed in his living quarters here. Yeah, well, that that aspect of Washington as a theatrical performer who understood the stage and the, and your display of the tent, I think, very powerfully conveys that as Mount Vernon is a stage set for his guests as well. I mean, the, the cupola on the top, the piazza, these are all crafting a, an image of a Republican uh, ideal that he's you know enamored of and trying to project one of the cool stories that i, I do want to have time for you to share mm -hmm. is the recent discovery you guys made um in that the the beautiful uh, that manuscript that painted uh manuscript which shows the tent in a i think it's a french watercolor of uh you know one of the the armies on the hudson there and the tent if in my recall of that uh that little image of the tent it has a little kind of um a little uh, portico, a little, <laughs> a little like, like Greek temple-like situation happening at the entrance. Am I wrong there? But also talk about how you discovered this image yeah. tent in action from the 18th century, which is unbelievable. Yeah. So one of the great uh, frustrations of a decade of research and, and writing the script and, you know, us sort of figuring out how we were going to tell the story is there didn't appear to be a single period kind of eyewitness image of Washington's tent in the field, it, despite the fact that lots of people described it, yeah. uh, left these incredible pen portraits. And it made such an impression that even in the 19th century, elderly Revolutionary War veterans in their pension depositions referred to being camped near Washington's tent or seeing Washington's tent. So we were thinking, like, how could no one have really painted this? Now, Charles Wilson Peale, you know, he'll put a tent in the background as a kind of trope to show Washington in the field, et cetera. But like somebody sitting down with a sketchbook, we couldn't find it. Right. And then, ironically, two weeks after we open in April of 2017, uh, an online auction pops up uh, in, uh, out in, uh, um, in Texas. And our, our chief historian, uh, Phil Mead, who was, you know, the co-creator of the museum here, who uh, also, you know, spends all day working at the museum and all night haunting uh, the online auction world, spots this interesting panoramic watercolor image. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out we were convinced it was this very distinctive hilltop with a tent set up on it. And as you mentioned, this little structure kind of looks like a jungle gym at first glance, but it's like a little a little piazza built off the front of the tent. And um, we had about two weeks to scramble to kind of research it and convince ourselves that we knew what we were looking at. And sure enough, we acquired this. And it's a, it's a seven foot long panoramic image of the Continental Army encampment in the fall of 1782, done by Pierre L'Enfant, who uh, of course was a French engineering officer in the Continental Army, yeah. would later design the layout of Washington, D.C., buried in Burlington. And there you see this image on the hilltop. And what's so, what was so affecting about finding this particular moment re reflected in an image was this is a year after Yorktown, you know, so it was a great, when most people think the Revolutionary War was over. So it was a great reminder of the two more years that it took to bring uh, this, this fight to secure American independence to a close. And Washington very self-consciously picking the highest piece of ground and setting his tent up there so that every one of those 8,000 soldiers, you know, the first thing they saw in the morning as they climbed out of their tent was their commander in chief in the tented field with them. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a great, it's a great object. We've, we've actually got a, we've done a catalog that we published um, uh, last year called Among His Troops. Washington's war tent in a uh, newly discovered watercolor and, uh, um, you know, hoping to get an online exhibit about this going up uh, sometime in the next year.
Uh, congratulations. I always love those new discoveries. And for you guys who know the most to, to be the ones to pull that out and, and make it available for us. It's so frustrating, as you know, the story of that era to have as many, you know, real life images of what it actually was. What a great uh, accomplishment. Matt's saying one more. Or are there, we there's done? actually a question in, uh, in regards to that. There's a question. Um, so, so Julie would like to know how far would the tent have been uh, from the field of battle? Yeah, where would he set up his camp tent uh, when he set up his camp? And then how far would he try to be away from action? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. So I'm trying to think off. I probably can't pull out of my head the closest uh, I can imagine Washington ever was, you know, in camp. Um, uh, you know, yes, well, he, the goal in camp was not to be near a battle. Yeah, you definitely want to be <laughs> safe and far away from battle yeah. when you're in camp because – you can't fight yeah. from a camp. You you know you need yeah. to be in order. Yeah. So that's yeah. the goal. But, the then, but then, but talk a little bit more about where he would place his tent amongst the camp. How important was it to him to have the right spot? Sure. No. It. it um, you know. I, I wish there were more um, cartographic evidence. You know, more drawings of of camps and that. There was a very sort of hierarchical standard way of setting up military camps in the period. This was There was actually a term called castramentation, uh, yeah. which was the science of military camps. And there are military manuals. I know many are in the collection there at, uh, at the library at, at Mount Vernon. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you know, the, the, the position of private soldiers through the non-commissioned officers to the field officers and so on, there was a great science to this. I think there is a lot of evidence that Washington, not just at Verplank's point, but at other points in the war, very consciously picked spots that were very physically visible to the army. That notion of being in the tented field, you know, he in, in the in the general orders that he issues two days before they march into Valley Forge. You know, he talks about that he will share in the hardships and partake of every inconvenience. Um Early in 1777 in New Jersey and near Middlebrook, you know, people writing general, you know, our, our good old general George Washington. Of course, he's not that old at that time. At least he's younger than I am now, uh, but that he uh, lives in lives in camp with us. So this I think he was very conscious uh, about always being seen as much as possible as, as living in that living in that tent. And we actually know you, know, you could drive from Boston to Yorktown, up the 95 corridor. And you can almost not drive 10 minutes, it seems, without a George Washington slept here marker. And of course, many of those historic buildings are headquarters uh, during the Revolutionary War. But one of the other comments from that John Nicholas that I mentioned earlier, the, the officer in the Commander Chief's Guard, is he said that it was Washington's practice, even when they were in quartered, when headquarters was in a building, to have that sleeping in office tent set up as a separate office in the yard. And mm -hmm. there are people who describe this in the period. So yeah. thinking of that as his, as his oval office, as his private space, um, that uh, was just something that is why we have so many descriptions of him yeah. from the period, I think, from French officers, from soldiers, and everyone in between. Well, it makes sense. I mean, space being at a premium to, for him to put it up, plus it keeps it better probably when it's up. Uh, so one uh, one note I'll make, and then we're going to have the final question. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who, who are interested in that image of the tent, uh, I'm sure they can find it online at your uh, webpage, right, Scott? Do you have a nice uh, digitized version of that available for folks to see? Of the of the image of Verplank's point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are in the process of redoing our website now, and there isn't actually there isn't an image up. However, I will say we do the, the catalog uh, among his troops. Yes, we actually have reprinted full scale, seven feet long, wow. twelve inches tall, uh, really? an archival version of that. Oh. Not just that, but there's a companion piece that L'Enfant did. It actually has been in the Library of Congress since the 1920s. Uh, of West Point, and they were done as kind of companion pieces. Huh. And so, if someone was interested in, in a, you know, actually having a reproduction of that, um, that's a great play, a great way to get a, get a hold of it. I, uh, I'm still waiting for my copy, so I expect that to be in the mail. I appreciate that. What a oh. great year! Thank you, Scott. The other <laughs> thing I want to point out is that um, George Washington in the new room here, which is just to my left, he has a wonderful portrait by Trumbull uh, uh, of it's Washington at Verplank's Point. Uh, so. 
fact, it, it's him with his beautiful horse, uh, and behind you can see troops, and he's sort of with the French army there, and he hung it directly opposite uh, from the portrait, uh, the coronation portrait given to Washington by the French of Louis XVI, and so that uh, that story of Replanx Point lives on here as well at Mount Vernon regularly, and that portrait of Trumbull is one of my favorites. If you go online and look yeah, mine at mine as well, yeah, uh, you know Washington at Verpanks Point by Trumbull, absolutely yeah. stunning. Makes him look like, as Joe Ellis would call him, a stud. <laughs> uh, let's have a final question and wrap yeah. this. Oh, let me just let me just say one of the one of the things we discovered as part of the research around this watercolor is um, that portrait, which of course Trumbull was actually at Verplanck's point in 1782. And, yeah. and when he did that painting as a gift to Martha Washington, commented on how he was very fastidious about all the details. We were able to show he was depicting Washington standing right by the door of the tent. He, wow. It's not just for artistic effect that he's placed them on that hilltop, but he's right. actually standing as if he had stepped out of the tent. Um, so. Well, there you go. So see your tent and Mount Vernon come together through that portrait, like he steps through time and space right <laughs> in the new room from your tent. So there you go. That's our that's our portal. If we take that off the wall, maybe I climb yep. through it and I end up in the tent. Absolutely. I'm getting a little sci-fi here at the end. <laughs> Let's get one more question before I lose it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one last question from Cynthia. Uh, she would like to know, kind of, what is what would have been in Washington's tent, and do, or do you have any original objects within your collection that would have been in there? Yeah, what do you have that from the inside of the tent in your collection? I know some objects in the Smithsonian. I know some here. Sure. At what do what do you have? We'll we'll compare notes on equipage. Well, you're going to win, but we do have a few <laughs> things. So, so one of those is that leather portmanteau that I mentioned, which almost certainly would have been stored. You know probably in the end, the sloped end of the tent uh, behind me as part of part of the baggage. Also, uh, 10 of an original set of 12 uh, silver camp cups. These are cylindrical uh, silver cups, kind of look like a julep cup if you've ever been to the Kentucky. They have the, crest, uh, they have the griffin on them, right? Is that right? So, we so these are just plain. Um, the griffin ones, he, he actually had made for himself later in the war. Okay. These were made in the summer of 1777. They're as plain as you can make something out of silver. You know, I think probably table use for all those officers and guests who are you know, yeah. coming into the coming into the dining tent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are there, and those are the objects. I think who drank out of those cups, right? Oh, I mean, some of the, the greats, right? And it's extraordinary. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Uh, and then some letters. We have some letters of Washingtons that are uh, also uh, also in the collection here. Yeah, you should give the letters to our library where we can take care of them. I don't know. Well, Maybe you, we could trade for a field bed. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, well, the field bed. No, we'll, we'll keep the field bed. We do have some canteens. I think we can give you a canteen. Those big, yeah. giant uh, uh, leather uh, canteens that carried not just water, but food and, and bottles of things and all that sort of thing. We have canteens. We got field cups. We've got we got a great field ch stool. Do you guys have a stool? One of those uh, little stools that are no, but we we've um, we've uh, we've replicated those. Of course, there the two that have come down. There's one at, at Tudor Place in Georgetown. Uh, and then the, uh, both of which came through the Peters family. And so when we bring the tents to Mount Vernon, as you know, we have a full set of 18 of those camp stools. The originals, of course, made by Plunkett Fleeson right down the street here in 1776. And it's wonderful to be able to, to sit in those and really uh, engage all of the senses, uh, as you imagine what it would have been like to be in Washington's tent. Yeah, they're really cool, this little thing. I think they'd be great to sell to people to go watch their kids' soccer games and, and all that. They're really, uh, really nice. And come yeah. back. We need to do that, man. Put that on yeah. the list of great ideas. So, okay. Um, why don't we wrap this up? This has been incredibly enjoyable for me, Scott, uh, to learn from you. You know, you know this stuff better than anybody. And I am just so impressed with the work you did with your museum. It's extraordinary. And the way you frame it as you know, a way to get people engaged in this great experiment in democracy and self-governance, which is so much a part of who we are as a nation and who and what we represent in the world as well. So, uh, you know, thank you so much for the hard work you've done and, and thanks for joining us today here at Mount Vernon. Oh, it's my pleasure. We, we couldn't feel uh, more warm kinship with another organization than we do with Mount Vernon. We're, uh, we're definitely uh, have a shared mission and uh, I hope that, um, 
we're, uh, I hope people are visiting us virtually now, both Mount Vernon and the Museum of the American Revolution. And I know we're both looking forward to greeting people again uh, on the backside of this mess we're in right now. That's right. We're both in the soup right now. So go online and uh, explore the American Revolution uh, Museum's webpage and make sure you're there on the first day they open up uh, in Philadelphia sometime this year. And uh, Scott, I hope to welcome you back to Mount Vernon soon. And I want to thank all the folks who've been working hard behind the scenes here, Matt Briney, Sarah Steele, and, and why don't you talk about your great team there? I've got Alex McKechnie, uh, social distancing in the uh, <laughs> in the uh, Alan B. Miller Theater here. So uh, um, thanks to all of them. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. <laughs> all those things. Signing off now. All right. Thanks, all.